Hello and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Today I want to talk a bit more about the Turnigy T1000 FC Flight Controller Unit. Very cheap, about 65 bucks with GPS. But is it any good? Now I did a bit of an intro to it. We pulled it apart, we had a look inside, found it's pretty well constructed. Uh, not a bad job, but uh, I've put it on the bench and I'm going to do some tests. Things like, um, you know, does it brown out? That's an important thing to know. And how easy is it to set up? And, and what are all these modes? And how do you hook five modes up to a three position switch? And things like that. Um, and also some other little things like documentation that is pretty crap now. Um, playing with it, I actually like it. It's a, it's a nice little unit, but the downside is that it's really, really poorly documented, really badly. The documentation, the, the instructions are crap, as you'll see. But um, my test on the bench, well, let's have a look at them. So here we are, I've got the T1000FC hooked up to a FreeSky X8R receiver. And as I say, they give you the little leads you need to do that. Now I've got three servos over here. There's rudder, elevator, and aileron. The, the output from the receiver just travels through these leads into the flight controller and then out to the servo. So it's a fairly simple installation and as I say, um, I don't have the GPS unit connected at the moment because it will run as a flight stabiliser without the GPS, in which case it's doing the same job as a $20 flight stabiliser but these are about 60 something bucks. So you're probably not likely to use it in this mode but I'll show you how this mode works because it's, you know, if you do have one and you want a flight stabiliser, well you can use it solely for that. So I'll turn it on and I think I have my, I have to move around a bit here move around the camera. I've got my transmitter here, so here we go. Aileron, elevator, rudder, that's all very simple, all straightforward, no problems there. And you'll notice that if I come back, I should have set this up better, but never mind. If I wiggle the unit, the flight control unit, just as if your plane was banking or climbing, diving, nothing happens to the servos. They, they don't move. They don't move at all. So this is what I call the pass-through mode. Basically the signals from the receiver are traveling down there, passing straight through there onto the servo. So this is as if this unit didn't exist at all. And uh, that's important for testing because you want to make sure that you can switch back to a pass-through mode if something goes wrong and you've got your gains all set wrong because I'll show you about gains in a moment. So now of course, oops, we have a three position switch on the transmitter which enables us to change our flight modes. I'm going to change to the stabilized mode. Now as before, you've got your rudder, your elevator and your ailerons. They all work, just move the sticks and the servos move. Nothing seems to have changed, but if you have this in your model and your model banks, well look what happens there. Look at the aileron servo. See it moves in response to the banking. And if you climb, look at the elevator servo. Or if you dive, the elevator servo moves. These are the gyros and accelerometers in here are providing control, extra control inputs to the servos to try and keep your plane level. So yeah, these counteract any turbulence or um, change in heading or bank or altitude that may be caused by external forces on your model. One thing to note though is look, the rudder servo does not move when we yaw the model. We've got roll, pitch, but no yaw correction. So that's a bit of a disappointment because one of the reasons you might want to use one of these on a model is if, you, if you've got a tail dragger, you know, like a Piper Cub or something, you're trying to do takeoffs, sometimes they can be really hard to handle on the ground and having a gyro on the rudder will help it track straight before, the, um, before you take off. You can stop it, make it a lot easier to handle a model like that on the ground, but there's no your stabilization with this. It's just roll and pitch. So there you go. That's the stabilize mode. Now, of course, there is a three position switch. So there's another mode. Let's go to the other mode. And it's this mode. Now, I want you to watch this servo here very carefully when I go to that mode. Here we go. Now, I'm not touching the transmitter. Here's my hands. Look, I'm not touching the transmitter sticks, but that servo is moving. And pretty soon, it goes to full deflection. What's with that? And you notice these have also moved a bit too, not quite as much, but they are moving all on their own. So what's going on there? Well, in this mode, the gyros in here are trying to hold the model at its last heading. This is like an attitude hold mode. And that means that if you're in knife edge, then you can, or you want to do knife edge, you bank the model into knife edge, and you let go of the sticks, it should just stay there in knife edge. But the problem is that there's too much drift in these gyros. If you were flying straight and level, you'd be end up doing really tight circuits because the rudder will peg out. You've got to constantly be putting a correction in to bring it back to center and it will then just drift back again. So yeah, I have to say I'm not impressed with the stabilization uh, in this 3D mode, I think it's called. And also another thing to note is if I give full elevator, look how slowly, full, away, full the other way, full, full, full. The servo response is very, very slow, and it doesn't center, of course, because if I go full up elevator or full down elevator and let go of the stick, the servo stays there. Go the other way, let go of the stick, 
the servo stays there because this is 3D mode now. Yeah, you could fly 3D like this, but yeah, I don't know. It's not a mode that I would use, but it's there if you want it. So, you know, you can't grumble if you get a feature you don't need. It's just an added bonus, isn't it? So there you go, that's the stabilization mode without the GPS. Now things get a bit more complicated because we're going to plug in the GPS and everything changes. So now as you can see the GPS receiver is connected here. I'll go back to the original what was the pass through mode because we're still using the same switch. We're still using the same three position switch. Now and what was the pass through mode so if I move my elevator, my rudder, my ailerons they all just work through there but before the gyros in here had no effect. It was just coming straight from the receiver through the system and straight out to the servos. It wasn't actually trying to stabilize the model. But as soon as you plug in this GPS, suddenly, oh, this becomes a stabilized mode. And so this is like the, um, the third position on the switch without the GPS. So the, <laughs> when you plug your GPS in, it changes what your switch does. It, it's a shame because it'd be nice if it was consistent. So you can set your model up without the GPS, just plug in the GPS and everything would be the same, but it's not. It turns the pass-through mode into the stabilized mode. Ah, I can live with it, but you know, it's just a bit of a shame. Still no yaw correction. See that rudder servo there? It's not moving when you yaw the controller, but the pitch and the roll are. So there you go. That becomes your stabilized mode with the GPS connected. So it's just like the third mode without the GPS. Now if we throw the middle switch to the what was the stabilized position before we now find yeah, it's still stabilized. Look at that. But in this case I think it does a return to home and this is one problem I've got with this otherwise very nice unit is that the documentation sucks. And it really does suck. It's a shame. It's a, such a huge shame because um, if the documentation was more accurate, it'd be so much easier to set it up. But it's like the person who wrote it doesn't even know much about aircraft. Let me just go down here, see if I can zoom in so you can get a bit of picture of this, in case you're not using HD. Here are the instructions, look at this. Apparently, airplanes have rudders on the wing. If you can read that in HD, see, rudders on the wing. And hey, they even have rudders on the tail plane down here, look at that. So everything's a rudder, <laughs> which is, even the rudder is a rudder. If we look down here, see, rudder on the tail, although you kind of expect that, wouldn't you? So yeah, the person who wrote the instructions probably never has used one of these. They just, I don't know. And also there's some LEDs on this thing here. If I can hold it up and you can see, you see we've got a flashing LED down here. We've got two flashing LEDs, one flashing red, one flashing green. So you think, okay, if I want to know what mode I'm in, surely I can tell by looking at the instructions. Unfortunately, the instructions don't tell you what the LEDs do, they tell you what one does. I've got GPS mode LED, that's the red one. And they point to that. There's no mention of the green one. If we go down the bottom of the instructions, try to keep this all in shot for you. It says that um, LED lights instruction. It says without the GPS module, the LED light will be solid. And without GPS, but sensor is in the state of initialization, the LED lights LED light quick flashing when power on, keep the airplane steady and level on the ground till LEDs turn solid. Okay, so that's just the calibration, initial calibration. And then GPS module connected and successfully bound, LED light flashes at two hertz speed, twice a second. But what about the green one? There's no mention of the green one, and there's a green one in there. So again, these instructions, very deficient and it detracts from what is otherwise a really brilliant piece of kit. So if you, if you, you know, I would say, um, I've done this before with these instructions and it worked really well. The secret to these instructions is this. There you go. Go online and you'll find plenty of people who have used this thing and they'll give you the details of how to actually program it up on your switch because there's a problem here. A small problem is that there's five flight modes when you have the GPS connected. There is the uh, stabilized mode with no GPS input. There is the attitude hold mode, which I presume is the, the um, 3D mode or whatever, it just keeps you going in the same direction at the same altitude. There's the altitude hold mode, which enables you to fly at a specific altitude, but you can still turn. And then there's the return to home mode. When you flick a switch, it'll fly back to you. So it says five modes, but I think there's four or five modes. How do you fit that onto a three position switch? Well, the answer is that uh, the center position can do two things. It can be, you know, two different modes, depending on whether your previous mode was uh, position one of the switch or position three of the switch. It's complicated, it's confusing. What a shame, it's a shame that they didn't actually just use another channel. Excuse me, I'll turn that off. The radio's going while I'm trying to do this. Um, it's a shame because you notice on here, they've got actually a, I'll zoom in on it so you can see. They've got a battery port on this 
device here. Now it doesn't need an external battery to run because it's powered by the receiver. These wires that come in from the receiver deliver the voltage. So they could have used that port as another input and used two channels, like a lot of flight controllers do, two channels to select the five different modes. Then it would have been so damn simple that uh, you, know, you wouldn't be confused. So uh, the, the, I say you know, the setup and the instructions detract from what is otherwise a really excellent little unit. So maybe they can improve on that, I don't know. The next step of course is to take this thing, throw it into a plane and see if it does fly and see if it does the return to home. I know some people have crashed trying to use these things, but I put that down to these because you can't tell what the damn thing's doing. But other people have had great success, so I think it's really a sound product, except it's just poorly documented. For example, over here we've got some little pots for adjusting the gains on the gyros, but they're mislabeled. The aileron pot is actually the rudder pot and vice versa. So that could cause a bit of confusion, you know, if you didn't know that. So that's why I say go online and check what other people have written about these things because, you know, <laughs> rubbish, rubbish. So don't worry about those. Now what I will do here of course is one thing that's quite important with our modern radio gear is, and I don't think anyone else has done it, is will this keep working if you have a brownout? It's all very well having a receiver that might operate down to two and a half volts, but what if this stops? So let's go over to our old, uh, well, you see I've got my bench supply over here. Currently I'm running at 4.9 volts, that's why I'm not using a battery, I wanted to vary the voltage. And we'll come down here and I'll just wind the voltage down until the damn thing stops working. So I'll get my transmitter here so I can wiggle the stick and I'll just wind the voltage down and we'll see when it actually stops. So currently we're at 4.9. Let's go down to 4.5, so it's still working nicely, down to 4, there's 4, yeah it's still going, down to 3.5, no it stopped, the lights have gone out, nobody's home at 3.5 volts, well the good old FreeSky receiver's still working, I can see the light's still on in there, but this has stopped at 3.5 volts, when does it come back, let's just wind it up until the LEDs come on. Here we go, it just started at 3.8 volts. Now that's, by today's standards, that's actually not very good. Is it working? No, it's still not working. Oh, the lights are on, but nobody's home. It's sort of just about working. So let's go up a little bit higher, 3.9. No, let's go up to four. Here we go, it comes back on at four. So, hmm, yeah, I don't know about that. That's, yeah, yeah. Suffice to say, you need to make sure that you, you haven't got a dodgy power system to this. So bearing in mind, this does draw current on its own. Um, you will need to make sure that your ESC, the, the BEC in your ESC or your standalone UBEC has enough power to drive this thing. Now what I'll do is, at the moment it's drawing about 200 milliamps, the, the bench supply isn't that accurate, but it's accurate enough for this situation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the servos, because they draw current. See it's gone down to 1.9, go down to there, it's gone down to, so it's about 100 and, yeah it's going up and down a bit. That's interesting, isn't it? About 180 milliamps at the moment with no servos. That's just the receiver and the GPS unit. The, you know, the GPS and the, what is it, the T1000. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to disconnect the receiver, unplug all the wires to the receiver. First of all, I'll take the power off. So let's go back to zero. And the freeze guy tells me the telemetry is lost. Of course it does that. Um, what I'll actually do is I'll power this back up. So this is just going to be, I'll go back up to 5 volts because that's going to be your nominal operating voltage. 5 volts. Okay, the FreeSky X8R receiver draws 80 milliamps. That's all I'm powering at the moment. 80 milliamps at 5 volts. Now let's just power up the flight controller separately. Unplug it from there, plug it into here and see what the flight controller draws. Here we go. The flight controller itself is about, yeah, 30 milliamps, so it's, it's not a lot. In fact, it's probably not a lot to worry about, I wouldn't really be too concerned, but it's going up and down quite a bit. Maybe that could be the lab supply, it's not a good lab supply. So let's say, worst case, it's probably drawing 50 milliamps, so that's not very much. You won't have to worry about the extra current draw of the flight controller, but be aware that if your system is a bit dodgy and the voltage drops down to below 4 volts, you could end up with a loss of, uh, loss of control because the flight controller may cut out, and that's between your receiver and your servo. So if that stops working, it doesn't matter if your receivers are working, it doesn't matter if your servos are working, you won't have any control. So do make sure you've got a really good UBEC or a really good BEC in your ESC if you're going to be using the system. So there you go, that was the bench testing. It's a little bit susceptible to low voltage, it shouldn't be a problem these days, uh, but be aware. Uh, some of the stuff on here is 
incorrectly labelled, some of the one of the LEDs isn't documented at all, the how to set it up with a three position switch is woefully inadequately documented, but it works, it, and the gyro drift, oh, not really happy with that, but hey, I wouldn't be using the 3D mode anyway, so it doesn't worry me. For 65 bucks, a device like this that can return your model to the point of launch, if something goes wrong, that's an investment, that's gonna, that could save you a lot more than 65 bucks if bad things happen. So what I've got to do now, of course, is put it on a model and fly it, and as we all know, I'm still waiting, waiting, waiting for bureaucrats to put the coffee down stop eating their biscuits and actually do it do the job so when they've done that this will be going on a model I'll probably initially just whack it on the outside of my AXN because um, I want to make sure for myself that it, it works as advertised no point in risking an expensive model for something like this in the test flight so I'll be testing it we'll have a part three to this review and then we'll do a sort of a roundup and just see whether I suggest you buy one but so far so far Aside from the little niggles that I had, yeah, it's not a bad looking product and it's certainly a lot cheaper than the other options we've got, although the other options do have OSDs and stuff built into them. But if you're not flying FPV, if you just want this to help you out when it's really rough and turbulent, um, or if you just want to be sure that if something goes wrong, your model will come back to you, then hey, this is definitely worth looking at, but stay tuned for part three because then you'll know for sure once I've test flown it. So in the meantime, thank you for watching. If you've got comments, questions, whatever, critiques, uh, put them on the bottom of the video in the comment section. If you've used one of these and had success or failure, then hey, share that information with the rest of us by putting it in the comment section on this video. If you think the video has been useful in any way, shape or form, give it a thumbs up and uh, tell your friends. Thanks for watching. See you again really soon on RC Model Reviews. Now it's time for me to get back to the bench.